Welcome to Cinematic Excrements. A while back, a friend of mine started a series of blog posts that she called the Best Picture Project, in which she reviewed every movie throughout history that has ever won the Academy Award for Best Picture. And lately, after covering the recent missteps of the Golden Raspberry Foundation, I felt some inspiration. Perhaps it's time for me to do my own Worst Picture Project. Granted, this does mean I am basically ripping off a friend's idea, but remember, imitation is the greatest form of plagiarism. So, let's go back in time to the first movie to ever win the Razzie for Worst Picture, Can't Stop the Music. Released way back in 1980 and the only theatrical film directed by actress Nancy Walker, Can't Stop the Music is a sort of fictionalized biopic about the formation of legendary disco group The Village People. That's right, they made a movie about a famous disco group in 1980, when the disco backlash was already in full force. That'd be like if they made a movie about Nickelback in the year... Well... No, that probably would have failed any year. The 70s are dead and gone. Supposedly, Razzie co-founder John Wilson was inspired to create his farce of an award show after seeing Can't Stop the Music as part of a double feature with Xanadu. It's a wonder he made it out alive. The film holds an 8% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, Siskel and Ebert declared it one of their Dogs of the Year for 1980, and it won the inaugural Golden Raspberry Awards for Worst Picture and Worst Screenplay, and was nominated in every other category but one. Other nominees that year include director Stanley Kubrick and actress Shelley Duvall for The Shining, director Brian De Palma and actors Michael Caine and Nancy Allen for Dress to Kill, and actress Betsy Palmer for Friday the 13th, which was also nominated for Worst Picture. And I gotta say, those nominations are questionable at best. Just in case you thought that was a recent trend. Now, to be fair, most critics did not like Friday the 13th at the time, and reviews for The Shining were mixed at best. Both movies underwent a critical re-evaluation years later and are now more highly thought of. Rightly so, in my opinion. But even if you didn't like the movies at the time, there was nothing wrong with Palmer's and Duvall's acting. As for Dress to Kill, I can kind of understand not liking that film. It has some pacing issues, and it's basically an inferior version of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. But again, the acting, not the problem. They also gave a Worst Supporting Actor award to, of all people, Laurence Olivier for the 1980 remake of The Jazz Singer. Now, I'm not trying to defend the jazz singer. The jazz singer sucked. I mean, this was the movie that put Neil Diamond in blackface for crying out loud. Casting Neil Diamond was bad enough since the man can't act to save his life, but putting him in blackface? Sweet Caroline, why would you do that? I would suggest the person who came up with this idea should be drug out into the street and shot, but I assume that person is the screenwriter and he's dead. So that ship has sailed, but anyway, Olivier's performance in the movie wasn't great. I mean, it was a bit on the hammy side, and that fake, uh, I'm gonna go with Russian accent didn't help. But still, I don't think it was bad enough to warrant a Razzie. And besides, giving a Razzie to Laurence Olivier just feels like sacrilege. I could understand if they gave him an award like Most Questionable Career Move or something like that. In fact, I'm... Kinda surprised that's not a regular award they give out. Seems like a no-brainer, really. Well, I'm not gonna spend the entire video dragging the Razzies. I've done plenty of that already. I have a movie to talk about, and that movie is Can't Stop the Music. Now, I am not going to waste any time whatsoever talking about historical accuracy because that's not what the movie is going for. It's not trying to be a serious biopic, and any facts about the village people's history that it does get right are probably by accident. So let's just jump straight into the plot. The plot. Yes. Yes, the plot. Of... Can't Stop the Music, yes, that is the plot of which I speak, yes. The plot for this movie that I'm talking about right now, yes. Yes, that plot, yes. Not a plot of land, no, the plot of the movie, yes, the plot. So the plot... of Can't Stop the Music... Well, the thing you have to understand about the plot is...
This might have been a mistake. Well, my fault for not thinking this through, and I apologize that this ends up being a really short video, but yeah, this movie really doesn't have a plot to speak of. It just kind of meanders aimlessly for about two hours. It's a lot like Twilight in that regard, except Twilight at least found an audience. When the movie starts out, it looks like it's going to have a plot, but don't you be fooled, it's a trick. The first main character we meet is Steve Gutenberg as Jack Morell, an obvious play on the Village People's original producer, Jacques Morali. He even kind of looks like him. He's a young man with a song in his heart who is ready to take the music world by storm. If only someone would just give him a chance. And yes, he really does sound that whiny. Mr. Schultz, I can't tonight. Ask me every Sunday for six months. Ask me Christmas, but please, Mr. Schultz, not tonight. I need action, not words. It's impossible. Look, nobody has time for anybody and nobody gives new people a break. You know how much that's gonna cost? Stop and listen. To what? To me. Listen to me. I don't know how his roommate Sam, played by Valerie Perrin, puts up with him. If I was in her shoes, I would have kicked his whiny ass out of my house years ago. Anyway, his music is allegedly really good. Not being much of a disco fan, I will have to take the movie's word for it. But there's just one problem. Jack is a composer, not a singer. The song may be wonderful, but your voice sounds like a cry for help. Ouch. Although, she's not wrong. So Jack has to recruit some people to sing his supposedly amazing songs. Fortunately, his roommate Sam is a famous model and used to bang several people in the music industry. And I'm not saying that to be crude, that's pretty much what the movie implies. So she has the connections that can get his foot in the door. Over time, they recruit six rather flamboyant and bizarrely costumed singers. Native American Felipe Rose, cowboy Randy Jones, construction worker David Hodo, G.I. Alex Briley, leatherman Glenn Hughes, and police officer Ray Simpson. And yes, they always dress like that. As far as the movie is concerned, those are not costumes. That's just their everyday outerwear. That's so stupid, it's actually kind of awesome. He used to sing with a group of policemen called the Cop Outs. Clever, huh? And that's so stupid, it's... No, that's just stupid. And eventually, they get a record deal. Eventually. But we have to sit through what feels like hours and hours of nothing to get to that point. It's remarkable just how boring this movie is. The first time I watched it, around the 40 minute mark, without even really thinking about it, I uncontrollably screamed out, Is something going to happen? And the answer is, no. There is nothing that happens in this movie apart from a lot of singing and some half-assed attempts at comedy. Now I will admit there was one moment in this movie that did get a chuckle out of me, because I am a child. Sam's story is she is no longer modeling and therefore can now eat whatever the hell she wants. And she seems to have a fondness for hostess confections. At some point, when she and Jack are trying to get a record deal, Jack says she needs to swallow her pride and talk to her ex-boyfriend, a music producer, which Jack reasons should be easy. Anybody who can swallow two snowballs and a ding-dong shouldn't have any trouble with pride. She swallowed two snowballs and a ding-dong, did she? Oh, that can't have been an accident. But the rest of the comedy is not that clever. Early on in the film, Jack and Sam throw a dinner party for some of their newly recruited singers, and Sam ends up accidentally dropping a contact lens in the lasagna. And for some reason, they keep coming back to the search for this goddamn contact lens in the lasagna. And at first, I wasn't even sure if this was actually supposed to be a joke. I mean, something like that has to be a joke, right? And yet... It never really feels like they're playing it for laughs. It's just something that happens. I was very confused. And while that's going on, there's a bit where Sam's manager, Sydney, played by Tammy Grimes, somehow gets her fingernail stuck in a phone booth. I'm not even sure how that works. And she's stuck in there for hours because everyone in New York City is terrible and refuses to help her. Isn't that hilarious? And then she tries to peek over the fence at Jack and Sam's party and gets attacked by a cat. Or at least that's what the sound effects would lead me to believe. We don't actually see it. And I guess they figured, you went to all this effort to spy on us for absolutely no reason. You might as well stay for dinner. Here, have some lasagna.
so crunchy. You know, that contact lens bit wasn't funny, and it was never going to be funny. And deep down, I think they all knew that. But you know what? They stuck to it. They committed to that bit and saw it through to the end. And I kind of have to respect that. There's also this really weird bit involving a guy named Ron White, played by Caitlyn Jenner in her big screen debut back when she was still known as Bruce. Ron ends up getting robbed by a little old lady at gunpoint. And... That's it. That's the joke, I guess? Now you might be thinking, well, surely there'll be a callback to this at some point, right? Or it'll turn into some kind of a running gag with people getting robbed by those they least expect, but no. No, that was it. That was the entire joke. Ron gets robbed by this Hell's Granny and she gone. Nothing ever comes of this and it's never mentioned again. This is bad comedy. Speaking of Ron, he seems to be the only character in this movie who has something vaguely resembling an arc. He shows up at Jack and Sam's party for reasons that are never adequately explained by the movie. I'm not kidding. I have no idea why he's there. He just is. And we just have to accept that. And at first, he is horribly turned off by the village people and their, ahem, <clears throat> lifestyle. He never actually uses the word gay or homosexual, but it's implied. I don't understand why a good-looking girl like you is down here in the village with a bunch of... I don't know what! Oh, I think you do. And to her credit, Sam does not hesitate to tell him to get stuffed. It doesn't matter how they live their lives, they're people too and they deserve the same respect as anyone else. I imagine this may not have been a terribly popular sentiment in 1980, so good on the movie for having the balls to say it. Eventually, Ron pulls his head out of his ass and apologizes, and Sam is pretty quick to fuck him. I mean, forgive him. What are you doing? These are the 80s, kid. You're gonna do a lot of things you've never done before. <laughs> He's talking about anal. And he ultimately warms up to the village people and agrees to provide them legal representation, and whoa. Even for the 1980s, that's a bit on the nose, ain't it? Clearly, he has become a bit more accepting of their... lifestyle. But despite Ron's best efforts, he will never look as gay as Felipe. But then, it's hard to look as gay as Felipe. I mean, this guy holds nothing back. And I swear his outfits somehow get progressively gayer as the movie goes on, which is honestly quite impressive considering this was the starting point. But then he cranks it up to 11. And then 12 and then 50. And I don't mean that to be derogatory. If I had a problem with anyone dressing in a way that could be considered gay, I would have left the Bay Area years ago. If Felipe wants to prance around wearing a pink feathered headdress and a G-string, more power to him. I only bring this up because Felipe is portrayed in this movie as straight. What the what? And it's not just Felipe. All of the village people are portrayed as straight in the movie, which is comical to say the least. I'm sure I'm not giving you any new information here, but the village people were created by Jacques Morali and Henri Belolo specifically to appeal to gay disco fans. Their mainstream appeal was basically a happy accident. And oddly enough, if you look at interviews with the various group members, they all seem to be completely oblivious to this, or perhaps just in denial. Even Felipe and Randy, who are, and were at the time, openly homosexual. Gentlemen, what do you of all people have to be ashamed of at this point? You're here, you're queer, get used to it! At this point, if anyone has a problem with it, fuck them. Anyway, given that this is a pseudo-biopic about a musical act, you would expect to find plenty of music in this movie. And you'd be right. In fact, Can't Stop the Music is basically a string of music videos poorly disguised as a movie. After all, there's no plot to speak of, so they gotta fill two hours of runtime with something. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if I'm necessarily the right person to talk about the music in Can't Stop the Music. Disco and I have never really been on speaking terms. That being said, I don't think I ever really hated the Village People. Some of their songs, like In the Navy or Macho Man, were admittedly pretty catchy. Although, the novelty of the YMCA dance wore off pretty quick. Then again, that's true of pretty much every dance that was popular in my youth. Remember the Macarena? The Electric Slide? The Cabbage Patch? The Tootsie Roll? I do. Despite my best efforts at blocking them out, I remember them all. And you best believe I danced all of them. Well... No, no, no. D danced is not the right word. No, I am wrong. Um... 
Stumbled, yes, that's much better. I stumbled all of them. I am as white as I look, what can I say? Anyway, the movie features 11 different songs, two performed by Dennis Fredrickson under the pseudonym David London, two by the Ritchie family, another Jacques Morali creation, and seven by the stars of the film, The Village People. I'm just gonna focus on those seven since I find the others to be various levels of meh. First we have I Love You to Death. Lyrically, it's repetitive as hell, though it is a bit of an earworm. The video features David Hodo and a bunch of women in red awkwardly dancing around, and I find it about as uninspired as the song. And I know Construction Worker was David's gimmick, but it really doesn't fit this video at all. Either he needs a costume change, or the ladies do. Then there's Magic Night. The song is... Okay, albeit incredibly cheesy. Compared to I Love You to Death, they at least put a bit more effort into the lyrics. The video is a bunch of idiots dancing around in a backyard. And it's every bit as exciting as I just made it sound. There's really not much more to say about this, so let's move on. Then we have an audition scene where Glenn Hughes sings Danny Boy. I'm not sure why they included an Irish folk song in a movie about disco, but honestly, I thought it was kind of awesome. Glenn had good pipes, and he does a great job with the song. Well done. Next is Liberation. I actually found this one to be pretty catchy. It's one of the movie's better songs. The video, however, is just another lame attempt at comedy. The idea is they're trying to show off a song and dance act for a major record producer, but they keep screwing up the dance moves. Wah, wah, wah. But why are they dancing around in a recording studio? The only thing you're supposed to do in a recording studio is, you know, record. Stupid. Next. Then there's Milkshake. In the movie, this is supposed to be the village people doing a commercial for, well, milk. And that's completely ridiculous since commercials are only like 30 seconds long and this song takes up three minutes. They did not think this through, did they? The song and the video are incredibly white. In more ways than one. I mean, they clearly put a lot of effort into this, which is more than I can say for most of this film. Between rehearsal and filming, they reportedly spent about three weeks putting this together. But my god, this is the whitest thing I've ever seen, and half the village people aren't even white! And the last new village people song in the movie is the title track, Can't Stop the Music, which was nominated for the Razzie for Worst Original Song. And while I'm not a fan of the song, I don't think it's that bad. It's not even the worst song in the movie, Milkshake Beats It Hands Down. The video is just a village people concert. Nothing terribly special about it, but man are those costumes bright. Even Glenn's outfit is somehow bright black. I don't even understand the physics of how that works, but there it is. And of course, they had to throw in one old favorite. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you what it is. That's right, it's the village people's biggest hit of all time, YMCA. And they're singing it in the YMCA, because where else would they be? And they're certainly not shying away from the fact that this song has been adopted as a gay anthem, are they? This is giving Felipe a run for his money. Check this out. Check this out. Look at how many dicks I have to blur out. Believe it or not, there was a time when you could have full frontal nudity in a movie and still get a PG rating. Whatever happened to the good old days? There is a bit of a funny story about this song and its composer, Victor Willis, the original Village People cop who was supposed to be in this movie. Despite the double entendres often interpreted in the lyrics, Victor, who is heterosexual, has long asserted YMCA was never intended to be a gay anthem. And other group members, including the openly gay ones, have backed him up on this. It was just a silly song about his childhood experience of him and his friends hanging out at the Y. Reportedly, he was so desperate to show the world how not gay he was that he insisted his wife at the time, Felicia Ayers Allen, now known as Felicia Rashad, be cast as his girlfriend. A bit insecure, are we, Mr. Willis? Look, you want to say YMCA was never meant to be a gay song? Fine, I believe you. But you'd have to be a damn fool to not see how people could interpret it that way. And so what if they do? As long as people are enjoying the song and they ain't hurting anyone, who gives a shit? And all that effort to assert his heterosexuality went to waste since he ended up quitting the band before they started filming. But while he never appears on camera, he still gets a few songwriting credits. Well, that's Can't Stop the Music. And somebody probably should have. Making a movie about disco when disco was on its last legs was a big enough mistake, but it's an even bigger mistake when the movie sucks. 
the acting ranges from tolerable to terrible, the plot doesn't exist, and for a musical comedy, it doesn't do a very good job with the music or the comedy. It's pretty bad. And it's not like the village people didn't know going in that it was going to be terrible. They knew. David Hodo said in an interview that the first time he read the script, he threw it across the room. And Willis actually fell asleep during the first read-through. The producers were not happy about that, but I don't know what they were expecting. Despite their best efforts at promoting the film, which included a Flavor of the Month tie-in with Baskin Robbins called Can't Stop the Nuts, I am not making that up. They actually called it Can't Stop the Nuts. Two snowballs and a ding-dong. Anyway, despite their efforts, the movie flopped spectacularly. On a $20 million budget, it only brought in $2 million at the box office. This, combined with the poor performance of Raise the Titanic, also nominated for Worst Picture, led to the dissolution of associated film distribution. You may not be able to stop the music, but you sure can stop the distributors. But over the years, the movie has gained a cult following, and while I wouldn't call myself a fan, mostly because disco just isn't my thing, it does have a certain campy quality, and I can understand why some people would get a kick out of it. So, were the Razzies right about this one? Well... Yes and no. I don't think it deserved some of its nominations. Perrin and Jenner didn't exactly turn in Oscar-worthy performances here, but considering what the script gave them to work with, I really don't think they could have done any better. And like I said, the title song wasn't that bad. But I'm not about to argue with its awards for Worst Picture and Worst Screenplay because woof. If you can get some kind of ironic enjoyment out of Can't Stop the Music, more power to ya. But I suspect my copy of the movie will be sitting on the shelf collecting dust for many years to come. Well, chapter one of my worst picture project was relatively painless. What do we have to look forward to for chapter two? Hmm. Let's see. 1981. Oh boy. Lasagna was good. Yeah.